Hello, physics friends. <clears throat> In our previous video, we were thinking about the concept of a derivative, thinking about our need for being able to find the slope at one precise location on a graph. Now, anytime we're calculating a slope, then we have to take two points. And in the previous video, um, I hope that I was able to communicate the idea of we get a better and better and better approximation as we slide those two points closer and closer and closer to each other. And so we can get our very best value for what is the slope at this exact point if those two points are so close together that there is um, that the separation between those points is so small that it would be like immeasurably tiny. We call that idea infinitesimal, like so close to zero, you couldn't tell the difference between it and zero. Uh, but what we didn't know is how do we do this? We know that slopes are incredibly important uh, for, uh, for a lot of ideas in physics. So how do we deal with slopes of curved graphs and not just straight lines. So that's what this video is about. So we're going to think about how do I actually compute a derivative? If I have a function, how do I find a new function that tells me its slope, that tells me a function for the slope of my original function? Now, you are concurrently enrolled in calculus. And you are going to learn a whole lot more about the how and the why and the details of more complex functions than what we're going to deal with right now. But for this moment, we do need to be able to uh, find slopes of some functions. So we're going to stick in this class until you catch up in your calculus class. Then we're going to stick with just monomials and polynomials as the kinds of functions that we are going to work with for now. And as your calculus knowledge from calculus class builds, then I'm going to expect you to be able to do more and more complicated derivatives. Um, and also, as far as your calculus class goes, you're certainly not off the hook in that class for understanding why do these rules about monomials and polynomials that I'm going to share, why do they work? So um, you will have a convenient way when you're first beginning to do this in your calculus class, you'll have a convenient way to check your work, but you're certainly not excused from needing to do the, the mental heavy lifting of learning those mathematical ideas behind derivatives, which you're going to focus on in your math class. But for right now, um, how do I find the derivative of a monomial or a polynomial? So um, here are our rules for how we do this. Um, first of all, um, rule number one, the derivative of a constant is zero. So if you think about what it means to take a derivative, it's a slope. So a constant, like let's say I have a function y equals four. If you graph y versus x, what that looks like is a horizontal line. What's the slope of a horizontal line? It's zero. Um, what's the slope of seven? It's zero. It has no slope. It's just a constant value all the time. So anytime I find myself needing to take the derivative of any constant value number, the slope of that is zero. Because a constant doesn't change. A constant flat line slope zero. Now, if I want to find the derivative of a monomial, so let's say 5x to the third power, or 2x to the fifth power, or 19x squared, or anything like that, um, it's a two-step process. And once you do it a handful of times, it becomes pretty automatic. Um, what we do is we multiply the original power of the monomial by the coefficient out in front, and then we reduce the power by one. If we think back to what we were looking at in the previous video, we saw that like our slopes, my position function, the first derivative of that is the velocity function, the derivative of the velocity function, which is the second derivative of the position function, I go from t to the second power, t to the first power, t to the zeroth power, t to the zeroth power, of course, is just one. 
but the power of the function decreases by one each time. And we see that here in rule 2b. Um, if I have a monomial, I reduce the power by one, but only after I've multiplied by the original power. So how does that work? Well, let's say I have a function y equals x squared, um, which the, the coefficient in front of y equals x squared, that's one. So y equals one x squared. So my first step, 2a, multiply by the original power. So I'm going to multiply my function by two, and then I'm going to reduce the power of x by one. So I multiply two times one times x squared, and then I reduce that power by 1. So 2 minus 1, the new power is going to be 1. So if my original function is y equals x squared, then my new, my derivative um, is 2 times x to the first power, which of course I can just say 2x. Or if I had the function 5x cubed, I multiply cubed, that's the third power, so I multiply 3 by the 5, 15 times x to the, reduce it by 1, second power. So the derivative of 5x cubed is 15x squared. Now, if I want to find the derivative of a polynomial, um, a polynomial is just a bunch of monomials added together. Um, and so I can find the derivative of a polynomial by taking the sum of the derivatives of the individual monomials. So if I had a polynomial y equals x squared plus 5x cubed, then the derivative, the slope function, would be 2x plus 15x squared. So again, you'll learn more rules for derivatives in your calculus class, but right now we're just doing a bare minimum for what we need. So looking at this again in a non-physics context for now, let's say I just have this generic function y equals negative 6x squared minus 2x plus 2. Um, I also just put some red dots on that graph of y versus x. That is a graph of that downward opening parabola. Um, and I put a dot here, and uh, that just I just picked out a point to the left of the, the highest point. Um, I put a dot at the highest point, and then I put another dot to the right of that highest point. And we are going to do the math of uh, finding the derivative, and we're going to graph that. And I'm going to plot three points that correspond to these three points on the position on the y versus x graph. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm going to uh, plot the uh, slope function as well. So to take the derivative, um, and again, the derivative, the way I write this, I'm doing delta y divided by delta x, but I want to take the limit as delta x approaches 0. And so we rewrite the limit as delta x approaches 0 of delta y over delta x. We rewrite that as dy over dx. So those d's are just tiny, tiny, tiny deltas. So dy over dx, I take the derivative, the sum of these three monomials that make up that polynomial, the derivative of negative 6x squared, I multiply the 2 out in front, that gives me negative 12 times x to the first power, and x to the first power I can just write as x, minus the derivative of 2x, now 2x, that's the same as x to the first power, so if I take the derivative of that one, um, multiply by the original power 1, so I get negative 2, times x raised to the 0th power. x raised to the 0th power is just 1, so it's negative 2 times 1. Another way we can think about that one, what's the slope of y equals negative 2x? Negative 2 is the slope of y equals negative 2x. Um, if I have a straight line graph, then that coefficient out in front of the x is the slope. And you've known that for years. And the derivative of 2, that's just a constant. If I graphed y equals 2, that would have a slope of 0. So that is it for 
what is the function for the slope. So the slope dy over dx is negative 12x minus 2. Now, if I want to make a graph of this, then I would be graphing the straight line negative 12x minus 2. Also, I can do some thinking about the general shape of drawing this graph without even like trying to you know pick out some points and plot them or ask my calculator to do it. One really useful thing that you're going to find yourself doing a lot of is recognizing that this highest point, that peak of the parabola, occurs where the slope is zero. At the peak of a curve, the slope is zero. If we make a tangent line, it's a horizontal tangent line, our slopeometers would show flat at that peak. So we could figure out, like, where is the zero of my slope graph if I think about what is the x value when the slope is zero? So the slope is zero when dy over dx is zero. So zero equals negative 12x minus 2. I can move the 12x to the other side, add 12x to both sides of the equation. So 12x equals negative 2. So x equals negative 1 sixth. So when x equals negative 1 sixth is when the slope is zero. And that's why we can see, and if you graph that original y function, that parabola yourself, you'll see that the peak really is, like I drew it, just a little bit to the left of x equals zero because we get zero slope at x equals negative one sixth. Now, if I think about this point here, at this first point on my y versus x graph, I have a large positive slope. This graph is steep and sloped upwards, so I must have a large positive value. This first dot matches up with that. Uh, I'll make the x values match up. And at this x value over here, I have a large negative slope. So coming down to this x value, I have a really large negative slope. And if I've done that well, then I'll have a straight line graph. good enough for you to get the point, I hope. Um, and now I've graphed the line negative 12x minus 2, if I have done this well. So there's some non-physics, but some mathematical thinking about coming up with these derivatives, these slope functions. Although what's also worth recognizing when we think about a slope function in the context of physics, is like we have names for the ideas that these slopes represent. Like if I have a position function, if I take its derivative, that's the velocity function. If I have a velocity function and I take its derivative, that's the acceleration function. So here's an example from the world of physics. Maybe you can recognize one of those coefficients as not just being a random number that I picked out of nowhere, but if I have the function y, and I chose y because, um, reminder, I use x's generally for horizontal positions, y's for vertical positions. So I'm choosing that I want to look at position on the y-axis. So I'm going to write out y equals negative 4.9 times t squared plus 12t plus 4 where that y is measured in meters, t is measured in seconds. Um, the 4.9 and the 12 and the 4 all have units. I left those units off to keep the function looking simple so that you don't get distracted by those things for right now. So to calculate a velocity function, or not to calculate a velocity function, but to take a derivative to find the velocity function, then I take the derivative of the position function. So I multiply this 2 by the negative 4.9. 2 times negative 4.9 is negative 9.8 times t to, I reduce that power by 1, times t to the first power. 
now I take the derivative of 12t. Um, if we think about what's the derivative of 12t, we're thinking like if I have a line y equals 12x, what's the slope? It's just the 12. Um, also, if we follow those rules, multiply, that's t to the first power, so multiply 1 by 12, and then reduce the power of t by 1, t to the 0th power now, and t to the 0th power is just 1, so the slope of 12t is 12. Plus, what's the slope of 4? 4 is just a constant. It has no slope. So my derivative, now I've come up just by knowing this position function, I can take its derivative, and now I have a function for velocity. And I could take the derivative of that velocity function to come up with an acceleration function. And maybe now, maybe you're seeing where this is heading. Um, it was hiding there all along. We just maybe never noticed it. But if I take the derivative of this velocity function, um, multiply the 1 by negative 9.8, I get negative 9.8 times t to the, reduce the power by 1, t to the 0th power. t to the 0th power, of course, is 1, so the acceleration is just the number 9.8. It has units, of course, that are written out there. Plus, what's the slope of 12? 12 is a constant, so the slope of a constant is 0. And so I get an acceleration of 9.8, measured in meters per second for every second. And now I would hope that you recognize, like, oh, this is a set of functions that match up with something in freefall. An object that is in freefall here on Earth um, follows this set of functions for position, velocity, and acceleration. And if I, if I knew one of those functions, I could create the other ones. Um, more generally speaking, uh, like when we think about what do these other numbers mean, like what does this 12 mean? Um, the 12, um, that's the velocity when t is equal to zero. That's our starting velocity. What's the 4 mean? The 4 would be our position when t is equal to zero because I'd have y equals zero plus zero plus four. So the 4 is the starting position measured in meters. And so I can think about a more general way of expressing all of this, just in terms of like y equals negative half of that gravitational acceleration times t squared plus the initial velocity times t plus y naught, the starting position velocity is negative gravitational acceleration times t plus the starting velocity. Acceleration is just that value, um, 9.8 meters per second per second if we're here on Earth, or whatever other value if you go somewhere else in the universe. And so if I know one of these functions, I know the other ones in terms of position, velocity, acceleration as functions of time. And two fun things about this, one, maybe three fun things, one of them is that this pattern of thinking is going to enable us to move on from only thinking about constant velocity, constant acceleration. What if I have an acceleration that is changing as a function of time? Our previous work, we don't know how to handle that, but here, if I can take derivatives, um, and even better than when I also build the skill of working backwards, um, then if I know one of these functions, I know all of these functions. And that can be incredibly powerful. Also, in your calculus class, if you are in AP calculus, something that's really common to see like on an AP calculus exam is a question like, hey, this object is moving given by this velocity function. Use that information to figure out the acceleration at a time of two seconds or something like that. Use this information to figure out um, how far the object has traveled after four seconds or something like that, where we're using these relationships that acceleration is the slope of velocity is the slope of position. And if you're in AP Calculus and you're going to get one of those questions, then um, that's a happy time for you because you're going to feel really comfortable and confident with that style of question. Um, they come up very frequently on AP Calculus exams. Fun times. Um, but also, and I, I hinted at this, uh, another fun thing. 
I hinted at this before, but like when you were a kid, you learned how to add and then you learned how to subtract. And, and in a sense, subtracting is like the reverse process of adding. And when you were a kid, you learned how to multiply and then you learned how to divide. And in a sense, we can think about dividing um, in some ways as dividing is like the reverse process of multiplying. And we'll get really powerful with our calculus skills when we can not only take a derivative to go from top to bottom, from y to v to a, but when we can go backwards, we can go from a to v to y, then you can build these functions just out of your own head um, without even worrying about, and we've built those functions out of like straight line graphs um, like straight line velocity versus time graphs. But even if you don't have a straight line velocity versus time graph, if you know any one of those functions, you can figure out the other ones. And that's powerful. That is a really powerful skill. And when we do that, the reverse process of taking a derivative, um, our first name that we're going to give to that is what we call an antiderivative. Um, and I think I'm going to leave it there for right now. Take care.